Good morning. Um, this is the session, um, the role of the regulator in promoting the deployment of IPv6. I'm Edmundo Casares from Mexico. Um, and here uh, we have some known uh, uh, people that work in Mexico on, well, let me introduce them. Um, on my right, we have uh, Pablo Hinojosa from IPNIC. Um, here is uh, Javier Juarez, uh, a regulator commissioner in Mexico from IFT. Sorry, Shafiq Chaya from uh, RIPE NCC and Guillermo Fernandez. Guillermo Fernandez from IFT, also from Mexico. Um, we have also a remote connection, and I think it's they are working on, on having him on board. Um, let me start uh, with a brief introduction on, on this. It's not really long. I just want to talk about, um, uh, can we, next, um, IPv4 depletion. It has been an issue uh, for several years now, talking about the rate that IPv4 has been used and is being depleted. And by now, almost all the regions have reached the point where um, we are using the last resources we have available and uh, we are applying the, the policies for depletion that we have already uh, implemented and we are using them. Only Africa is not in, in this point of, of last resources. But it's expected that next year we'll reach this point. Um, also, well, that, that information was taken from Futaro, the, the information that generates Jeff Houston, and it shows also the, the quantity of addresses that remain in each region. Um, all the regions are using the less resources, uh, some are implementing some uh, measures like uh, um, list to organizations that seek more addresses. Uh, others are limiting the quantity of addresses that are assigning to their members in order to keep uh, helping them to adopt IPv6. But the reality is that we are almost at the bottom of the barrel. There is no more IPv4. Um, there is no way to have more IPv4. And we are being, have been talking about adopt IPv6 for many years now. Um, can we have the next? Thank you. But talking about depletion of IPv4, what happens when there are no more IPv4 addresses? Well. The issue is that the net keeps working. The net is not gonna break, but we are gonna have a really tough time adding more equipment to the net. And it's gonna be uh, difficult adding customers to the network as we don't have any more addresses to assign them. And it's an issue that more and more organization and are facing once they finish their stock, they reach the registry, and they can't give them any more addresses. Um, yes, thank you. IPv6 adoption, not a new issue, as I have told you um, more than 10 years talking about it. A lot of technologies have been developed for adopting the protocol. Um, all the regions have a, a policy of free adoption by the operators, and diverse results by country are given as results. Uh, for example, in Mexico, we are about 
uh, as of today, up about 50%, and different countries have different percentage of adoption. And now, I would like to start this, uh, this meeting with two questions. Is there a problem really with the rate that IPv6 is being adopted? Is, is that the road rate that IPv6 has? Because it it's has been uh, heard a lot that we are too slow, it's not fast enough. But is that, in this point, really an issue? I don't. Uh, I would like to start with Shafi. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Thank you, Edmondo. Uh, first, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you, and thanks for the uh, Federal Institute of uh, Mexico to invite me there. And I would like to share with you some of our experiences that uh, we are work and they collaborate with our members at the RIPE NCZ services. Uh, we are covering around 76 countries in Middle East, Europe, and Central uh, Asia. And we are uh, cooperating and coordinating with all our members in a multi-stakeholder uh, approach uh, to discuss and promote and see what's the issue with IPv6 and other related uh, internet issues. So first, for sure, the IPv6 adoption is not at the level that we are desired and expected. Especially that the pressure now is coming from the IPv4 pools, which are near to be exhausted. No more IPv4, so what we'll do. We can agree that the low adoption of IPv6 is a symptom, and it's not a root cause. So why the adoption of the IPv6 is still low in many of the countries? Is it a technical failure that the new uh, uh, protocol is not working well and the IPv6 is, 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 is broken? Given the fact that Google uh, report 25% of the traffic delivered is through IPv6, I don't believe so. And many other examples regarding the T-Mobile in USA, uh, Skybridge in UK, Swisscom and other places, all these operators, they are deploying the IPv6 and connecting millions of users. Same we can tell for the content. Many operators openly inquire why we don't have content and application that support IPv6. Again, if we go to Google or any other international players like Microsoft, Akamai, Cloudflare, we see that they are running their application and content and they have the IPv6. So it's not the case. So what's the issue here? It's awareness. From our experience, I can tell that five years ago, yes. But now, I don't believe so. When we, approach the, when we were approaching the, the operators and the ISPs five years ago, the main to, two reasons, or let's say, that we captured from them is that why we need the IPv6? We have no demand from the end users, and we have the netting, we have the CGN, so it's okay for us. It's working. However, today we can see that almost the majority of our members, around 75%, they asked for their IPv6 addresses. And a lot of these operators, they have pilot projects or they are already deployed their IPv6. There is a common understanding that the IPv6 deployment mid-term and long-term is cheaper than to go with the IPv4 operations. 
However, we can see something, and we note something that the, the operator that they are deploying, the IPv6, or they don't want to share their experience with the others because they have this magic weapon for them, or they don't have enough data to make a case study of what, what is the benefit of the IPv6. So here is, I believe, the main role that the regulatory authority can play. So what the regulatory authority can do in this case? The regulatory authority, they have the authoritative and the investigative powers. So instead of calling for regulation intervention or regulatory intervention, let's, go, let's call for what we call, let's say, regulatory investigation. And I, I had a chat with my friend from the French regulator yesterday. He mentioned something really interesting, and I will quote from him. I respect the copyright. So he said, from a regulator to moderator, which is proven to work excellent with our uh, members, uh, either a regulator or governments. So the regulator had an important part in this to get all the, the, the players, all the stakeholders under one roof, discuss with them, and see what is the problem or the issue in their market. I can give some examples, very successful examples that we have now working with Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Lebanon. And we have in the sale here the Dr. Abdelmina Yusuf from Lebanon who can give us or share with his views. He was the ex general director of the Ministry of Telecommunication. Maybe he can elaborate on this. And I believe the French regulator is there too. Maybe Samih can tell us the experience of how this regulation becoming now moderating for the promoting IPv6. So I can submit that the benefit that the regulatory community can give to the global internet community is to work and investigate why their market is not behaving as expected or desired. And from there, as a technical community, we can go and work in this multi-stakeholder environment to give the right tools to do the right job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shafiq. Um, now, I would like to, to give the word to Pablo from EPNIC. Thank you, Edmundo, and good morning. It is very nice that you chose uh, IPv6 as a topic for an open forum. And it is a great honor and privilege to be here with uh, former colleagues uh, of uh, the Mexican regulator, formerly COFETEL, now IFETEL. This is also great um, as an open forum uh, from the Mexican government. Uh, it got a big room, and it is not easy in this IGF to get uh, such a space. It has been very competitive. Um, the good thing about this is that uh, if the room is not full, there is full transcription. So I hope this is also an opportunity to leave something uh, useful for the record and for posterity. Um, at the time of the origins of the internet, and this is for those of you that don't come from a technical background, uh, it was impossible to predict how successful uh, it was going to be. And uh, at the time, uh, the address space uh, of, of, of the internet was around 4.2 billion unique addresses. And at the time, it made much sense. Uh, so um, they never thought that it was going to grow uh, as it is today. But 30 years later, uh, there is an estimate of more than 20 billion devices uh, currently connected to the network at a uh, global level. So there are around five times more devices than unique IPv4 addresses of the original internet protocol. And this, of course, mean, means that not every device connected has a unique uh, IP address, public unique uh, IP address. So many work uh, under one public IP address and behind network translator machines, uh, and of course this has a lot of implications. Um, um, so that is why uh, there is uh, this um, much, much bigger IPv6 space, uh, which 
we obviously support and promote uh, to deploy. The issue is that IPv4 and IPv6 uh, have issues of compatibility and there needs to be some migration in terms of equipment, etc. So the, the topic of today, as I understood, was whether the regulator can play some sort of a role in promoting IPv6 uh, deployment adoption um, uh, in Mexico, but also in other parts of the world. And this is very interesting because, uh, of course, uh, we as uh, the Regional Internet Registry in Asia Pacific, APNIC, uh, work uh, very collaboratively with uh, all uh, different uh, stakeholders, our members in particular, as Shafiq said, um, in providing them uh, with addresses, services, and um, technical training. Uh, it is a very important part of APNIC's activities but uh, also with uh, governments as they indeed have an important role in promoting IPv6 uh, adoption or can have. Uh, but this also opens the door for creative uh, and, and uh, good opportunities for enabling and catalyzing um, industry and government efforts uh, into IPv6 adoption. Um, an example of what we have done uh, together with uh, uh, regulators, and this is uh, at the international level with uh, ITU. Actually, ITU is having a very important conference at the moment in Dubai, uh, the plenipotentiary conference. So APNIC is a sector member of the development uh, part of the ITU, and uh, the ITU uh, has uh, most of the regulators as uh, uh, its core part of its membership. And uh, they have been also promoting IPv6 uh, deployment throughout the years. So APNIC and uh, ITU have collaborated in uh, the Asia Pacific region to uh, promote um, uh, and to um, uh, build capacity at the technical level because uh, there are indeed uh, a lot uh, in the government, as probably we will hear from our colleague from IFETEL, um, the, the, the government agencies have uh, networks and they are a very important part of um, uh, sort of the use of the internet and they can be a very good example about um, uh, sort of promoting IPv6 uh, by them setting um, sort of the, the, the standard. So with ITU, we have uh, uh, had very good uh, opportunities to um, uh, do technical trainings uh, for technical people from the government. And uh, they go back home and um, improve uh, the uh, capacity of their networks to deploy IPv6. Um, so that is one example, and I'm happy to uh, work uh, during this panel to, to talk about other possible examples. Thank, thank you, Pablo. Um, Shafiq had um, mentioned uh, the French regulator, and I would like to, to give him the, the word. Uh, thank you, Trafik. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't like to take the spotlight from the speaker, but I will give you a concrete example of what uh, the French regulator is doing for promoting uh, the transition to IPv6. And uh, in this uh, case, our active promotion started in 2016 with a report submitted to the government with the concert of AFNIC, which is the CCTLD of France, in which we, it contained several actions that should be put in place in France. Uh, it's mainly six actions, uh, which are like lead by example, uh, providing widespread IPv6 training, creating a south road map for the promotion, uh, for the transition to IPv6, improve coordination, fifth, better information for user, and finally prefer, prepare the end of IPv6. If I take the exemplarity part, we start with ourselves. We put our website on IPv6, and funny fact, we're the only website hosted in IPv6 for our uh, hosting provider. This is funny, but it's the case in 2018. 
Second thing uh, that we put in place is an observatory uh, we call barometer. You have like uh, several examples here. Uh, and uh, in this barometer, what we're doing is we're doing what we call uh, data-driven regulation. So what we do is that we collect information from operator and optionally from hosting provider as we don't regulate them. And then we gather other information from the different uh, links of the technical chain so that we have an overview of all the actors within France, either transit provider, DNS infrastructure, ISPs, mobile uh, uh, operators, uh, hosting providers, uh, and eventually for next year it will be administration and uh, companies, but also information about devices and the uh, uh, operating system that uh, work uh, only in IPv6 or that need IPv4 to work with IPv6, so that won't help us get rid of IPv4. And uh, this uh, observatory uh, was uh, like uh, uh, well appreciated by the ecosystem because it helps them see also how the different actors are forecasting their transition. So there is only, not only actual data, but forecast about the transition for two, one year, three years. And we have even data that we didn't publish about five years. But, uh, and uh, we had like different difference uh, in uh, the transition uh, how to say it, strategies so we need uh, we needed to know why so for this case we set up in place a workshop last month also with the consent of uh, AFNIC and the uh, internet society and uh, there are many people here that were here thanks Gordon Lennett for being here and uh, we had ISPs, hosting providers, uh, association, uh, public society, oper uh, mobile operators. Also, we had government there to see first the problems for this transition and at the second time, uh, what are maybe be the solutions for this problem. First, it's important to know the problem because now we have many people that are looking for solution for non-existing problem to IPv6. So the fact that we have not published yet the results of this workshop, that's what we are planning to do in the next months. So gathering people around the same table, here as Shafiq said, we were not working as a regulator. We were there to gather different people that don't speak with each other around the same table to deal with several issues related to the transition with the uh, ISPs, transition with hosting provider, transition within administration uh, and uh, companies, but at the same time, tr transverse issues like quality of service and security on IPv6, training for IPv6, and the uh, end of uh, IPv4 and how to anticipate this because it's something that should be anticipated 10 or 15 years before so that the different actor uh, are ready and uh, they are aware about what they should do so even if we don't have a, like a legal background it's a soft law approach that uh, help make the different actor aware of the importance of IPv6 makes the government also aware about something that is invisible for the end user we can sell better 5G than IPv6 why not link in IPv6 to 5G this is another issue so uh, as a regulator, we're here to moderate, to facilitate, to make people speak with each other so that they can work together to, toward accelerating this transition because at this pace, we can't cope with the scarcity of IV, IPv4, especially at ripe level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, we have uh, uh, Guillermo. Person. Um, yeah, uh, we are taking questions uh, at the at the end of the. Yeah, I try to answer his question because I'm the board member of the one of the telco. Uh, we actually turned on the IPv6 by February this year, and till now, uh, right now. The IPv6 capable is up to the 75% already, from 0.5% to 75%. And you are asking why the telco or ISP have to turn to the IPv6 
I give you a very simple reason. Because uh, if you are going to survive, uh, provide your customer a solution, if a startup company or any expanding industry, when they want to do the internet service, they need an IP address. But IPv4 is gone. IPv4 is run out. Right now, I tell you the truth. If you want to get an IPv4 from the market, one IPv4 address costs you 15 US dollars. But if you go to the IPv6, almost free. And so that is a reason um, for my company, we have no choice. And so we can provide as much address to the uh, internet company they are going to stop or expansion. The third thing is uh, very important is uh, the cost between the IPv4 or IPv6 actually is not that, not that dramatic. Uh, in the very beginning time last year, my technical people told me there would be a you know, duplicate team to do the IPv4 and IPv6. But from this year, from the February this year till now, actually it's not, that is not true. And of course uh, there is a certain thing you need to work with. The first of all, because uh, in the mobile market, there is a two major provider. One is the Apple, another one is the Android systems. For Apple, it's more complicated. For Android, it's easy one because the people can turn on the V6 by themselves. For Apple, it's a, you need to have a certificate. Um, you need to have a report. Send it to the Apple computer. Then Apple computer verify your environment is ready for V6. Then Apple will turn on. And Apple basically is a turn on. You only have two time slots, depends on the countries. Uh, if you well, don't turn on now, you need to wait another six months for well, turn on. So that's a quick answer for the people question about the IPv6. Thank you. Uh, we are keeping with the presentations and we will take questions at the end. Thank you. Well, now we are going to, well, we have Guillermo. Good morning. Uh, could you please play the presentation for me? Thank you. Well, my name is Guillermo Fernandez. I'm the CIO of the IFT, which is the Mexican regulator of the telecommunications. What I'm here to tell you is the journey that we have as the regulator have gone through to migrate, to transition our portals to IPv6, how, how we've done it, because the one, point, one standpoint is the, the regulator one from the, uh, the board of the IFT and the other where we were trying to, to experiment is as a user, as an end user. So what I'm about to tell you is how did we take this project, how did it, uh, what, uh, it became necessary, and uh, how have we done it, how, where are we now at this point. Next, please. Well, for, as, as a colleague said, for those of you who are not uh, technical background, I'm just about to tell you a little bit about the, the business unit that I am, I, I'm the head of. I'm the general director of ICT in the AFT, which is the area that's in charge of running the IFT's infrastructure. I'm responsible for all the things about networking, PC systems, applications, and all that stuff, or telephones, whatever. Uh, in addition of that, I'm responsible for the information security role, so I'm also, uh, I have a team which is in charge of all the cybersecurity measures, all the procedures or standards, methods, controls that are implemented to uh, prevent uh, business, uh, information leaks and, and that, type, that type of, of uh, things. And uh, we are also advisors of the business units in their projects that they are uh, planning that use uh, ICTs in, in in, in place. So that's the role of the unit I run. 
uh, a little background also is that the infrast IFT's infrastructure was inherited from its predecessor, the, the COFETEL, was the, the former regulator in Mexico. The, the thing with that infrastructure is that it was particularly old and it was bound to leasing contracts, so we had to let all that infrastructure uh, to keep uh, functioning until we had, we had to change it by contract. Uh, none of those equipments were IPv6 ready. They were only functioning in IPv4. And uh, a lot of cybersecurity measures had to be taken because uh, we had some serious things to, to, to take care of before we could even think about migrating to IPv6. So that was the, the, the first step. Uh, what the, the next uh, slide, please. What made necessary this project? Well, as our colleagues have already said, uh, IPv4 addresses are depleted. We have no rights or we have no assignment on, on our IPv4 addresses. So every time, the, the consequences we had is that every time we change our, IOS or our ISPs, we have to change our DNS managers and we have to make a little uh, film steps before we, we, made, we made the change of ISPs. The DNS replication worldwide takes between two and 17, uh, 72 hours. So that means that every time we change our ISP, we have to wait until some, some time before our portals, our websites, our, our email service was, uh, repl were replicated all, all over the world. We were like invisible in that period of time. And uh, well, every time we, we, we changed the ISP, it was a funny thing because they, as some of you may know, when you change the IP address of an email ser service, it has to generate some reputation. If not, you get classified as a spam. So those were the, the type of problems we had with, with the IPv4 uh, uh, by broadcasting we, we, we had before. The first step we, we, we took was we had to deploy a global traffic manager solution, which made us uh, independent uh, from, our, from our ISP and uh, DNS uh, service. We are now authoritative in the namespace of, of, of our portals. And we had to install some DDoS, anti-DDoS solution before we even start planning or implementing our transition to IPv6. Next slide, please. How, how do, we, do we take this project uh, in play uh, now? The first thing is, and it's an obvious one, but not that obvious because we have to, to, to think it through and to, 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 to put it in place, is we have to train all the staff from workshops, papers, uh, I mean, uh, going to, to some uh, even uh, schools and, and courses and all that stuff, because we found out that not all the technical staff in the, in the unit had experience or skills to, to make this transition. So that was a very, very first important thing we, we did. We had to make an assessment, we had to make, to make an assessment of the, the, the situation we were. We had to establish some scope of the project. We put this, uh, we Established this project in two phases. The phase one is only public portals, and depending on the uh, use cases we have in place for that, the end of the phase one, we, we will evaluate if we migrate our internal internal network to to the whole uh, IPv6 protocol. The time frame for the phase one was one year. It started in this one, so we are about to finish it, and hopefully we will end this year by. Uh, by, by having our portals, on, our main portals in IPv6. The uh, requirements we, we have so we could take this project on was the renewal of the main telecom and cybersecurity equipment, as I was telling you before. The first year of, of this uh, project, uh, we didn't have all the equipment ready to be changed. The ISP had to be ready to broadcast in IPv6 because in Mexico in, in 2016, uh, there were only two carriers formally giving this, that service in Mexico. Now this is a different reality. We have a lot of ISPs in Mexico giving IPv6, but back in t two years ago when I was starting pl to plan this project, there were only two formally giving that service. And well, we have to get the IPv6 assignment. Next slide, please. 
The execution of this project so far this year, as I was telling you, this, this project took place this year. Is we had three public meetings. Uh, two of them were to put in place a, a network operation center. The, the second one was to put in place a security operation center and the change of our ISP that now supports IPv6 routing in, in simultaneously as IPv4. The, the, the last uh, phase of this uh, contracting journey was uh, to get the IPv6 assignment, which requires, uh, there are some of the requirements that uh, we have uh, had to fulfill in order to get the assignment, the diagram and description of the network topology, routing plans of the protocols, and uh, the procedure that has a 30-day 30, a 30 limit to, to take place and be executed. Next slide, please. After those uh, steps have been taken, uh, we're expecting at the end of this year we will be finally uh, having all, all public portals published in IPv6, uh, and that will be the, 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 the journey where we will be having as a regulator and as, a, as an end user. So uh, there are some final thoughts we have uh, from this experience we have uh, had with this project. We think that uh, for a government, for government standpoint, we have to make some adjust, adjustments on our contracting procedures so that this transition for the IPv6 assignment gets easier. Uh, it's necessary to take more actions to, towards promoting this, this transition in the companies, it's all, overall in small ones. Uh, it's very important to share experiences. We have put in place an, a website which uh, is a, a completion of all these practices, papers, and uh, uh, library and, and experiences from, from IPv6 transition and, and literature over, all over the, the, the world. And the, the papers we have uh, compiled. And, uh, well, that, that has been the experience we have had so far. In the next slide, we, you will see the, the URL of our MP, IPv6 website. So next slide, please. I invite you to visit our website. It's in Spanish, so but hopefully you will get an important information. Not all the papers and documentation there are in Spanish, a lot of them are in English, and uh, well, I invite you to, to visit it, and that has been the, the journey we have had in transitioning, in Mexico's transition to IPv6. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. And now it, we have a uh, Javier from the commissioner from IFT in Mexico. Thank you, Edmundo. Good morning, everyone. I'm almost the, the last one. And it's important because as regulators, it, we have to listen carefully to all the experts. I will start by saying that a long, long time ago, when I was studying my master's, actually here in France, in 2005, a teacher told us that in order to promote uh, the IPVC's adoption, we needed a killer application. Uh, this year, in an IETF meeting in Montreal, I saw this teacher and I asked him if, in his view, and now we had that killer application. And he told me yes. The Internet of Things is the killer applications to foster IPVC's adoption. Uh, I agree with him because uh, every device connected to the Internet needs an IP address, unless it's an uh, analog iPad like this one, I mean uh, uh, a notebook. Uh, otherwise, all the cars, the wearables, the smartphones, they will need an IPv address. And we don't have IPv4 address 
addresses anymore. So we need to move to the IPv6 protocol. As one colleague said, uh, we have no choice. We have to move to the IPv6. And regarding that, and since the name of this panel is the role of the regulator in promoting the deployment uh, of IPv6, I would like to share with you what is, in my view, the role of the telecom regulator. Uh, the IFT, the telecom regulator in Mexico, uh, has, to, has to promote the efficient development of the telecom sector. If we want to accomplish that goal, we need the spectrum, we need the rollout of uh, networks, telecom networks, and of course, we need to transit to the IPv6 protocol. We cannot think about uh, an efficient telecom sector without IPv6. Uh, so far, we have already mandate that in the interconnection of public telecom networks in Mexico, uh, carriers have to use, they must use the IPv6 protocol. Also, for the traffic exchange at the internet traffic exchange point, the telecom operators are supposed to use IPv6. Uh, LARCEP, the, the telecom regulator in France, uh, has an approach of sub-regulation. They have something like uh, regulation par la data, uh, regulating with data, and with that approach, they have, uh, they say that with information, the right information, the market could move in the right direction. Uh, with the same approach, uh, we have a kind of observatory in our website. Uh, and in that observatory, we want to promote the benefits of IPv6. We've, uh, we have access to guidelines and best practices, statistics, among other, use, other useful information. Of course, we have a lot of things to do. In the future, we need to create maybe a national policy, uh, a holistic policy for the transition. It could include, for example, uh, the creation of more statistics. By now, we only have uh, traffic statistics that in fact is the reference to Cisco and Google uh, we need, uh, for example, how is the network equipment, uh, the websites that supports IPv6. We can work together with other uh, stakeholders like NIC Mex Mexico, for example. Uh, maybe we need to create a task force for IPv6 deployment to see what is happening around the world and adopt best practices. Uh, create a directory of uh, carriers that are already uh, providing IPv6 services. Uh, last year, uh, my team was trying to uh, contract uh, IPv6 services, and when they called to the uh, telecom providers, the telecom operators, they don't even have any idea of what we're talking about. Uh, maybe we need to create a partnership with uh, universities. Uh, we need to train the human resources that understands IPv6 because by now, all, almost all the technical courses, all the technical programs are based on IPv4. And last but not least, maybe government should uh, create, create demand of IPv6 services. As you can see, these are some, it's not an ambitious agenda, but I think it will be a very important contribution for the IPVC's adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. I think well, we are running out of time. I think we have a remote connection. Hello? Is there? 
Is, is there the, the yes, I want to know if I'm hearing, if, uh, if do you hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you to, to give me this opportunity to, to talk. So I will be very short. Uh, and my name is Manga Willy. I'm working for Agence Universitaire de la Francophonie. And we are located in uh, all the continent. And me especially, I'm working in Africa, in Cameroon. Uh, <clears throat> I will not go through my presentation, but I will just uh, give a little experience from, for what we have done since uh, three, four years. Like, you, uh, like many of you were saying, uh, in Africa, uh, 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 Africa has still some IPv4 prefixes. But we did not, um, we, uh, in our case, we did not stand and we, we prefer to, to move forward and use IPv6. Uh, why did we prefer to use IPv6? Because we are working in um, academic fields and, as, and we are an association working with the academic and as such it was necessary to understand IPv6 and implement it within our, its, our own networks. And in our country, in Cameroon, all our ISP already has uh, IPv6 prefix. For instance, uh, our provider has uh, its IPv6 since 2006, so it means 12 years ago. Um, and how did we proceed? Uh, there were uh, some training of technical staff, but the most important thing I want to mention here is that we do a lot of advocacy towards uh, management staff uh, because uh, it was in uh, IPv6 is not uh, really a technical issue as of today. The most important is the commitment of people who want to actually want to who want to implement it. So uh, we we take a lot of time to to do many advocacy. And we have many issues when we try to implement it, but at, at last it was it it is working since since two two years. Uh, our forecast, if I can give you some forecast, is that we want to convince our members. Our members are the university to use IPv6 for the daily for the daily needs, but also for the research. We are collaborating with on uh, an IPv6 certification with AFRINIC, which is the regional internet registry in Africa. And right now in our office, we, are, we have a session on training people before they, they make the first exam certification on IPv6. And in our region, in Central Africa, we want to engage gradually all our ISP in the sub-region on IPv6 deployment in our different offices. And what I can suggest to regulator is to, among other solutions, of, uh, of course, is to promote IPv6 deployment within government networks, ministry, presidency, regional office, and even the regulator itself. And also, at last, uh, do not focus on plan, but start to deploy somewhere. Because I know that in some countries in Africa, there are many plans, but some, some organizations have not already deployed something on IPv6. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, now we have a short time. Um, we, we can have questions. Uh, let me let me give it clear. Um, my oh. sorry, I, uh, just to get back to you and the, to the remarks uh, concerning the was it me or yes? Yeah. Well, you, uh, okay. but so, uh, I need uh, to make a, a, a short. Uh, need to be short questions because we need to close the, the panel. Okay, so uh, it was just correction remarks more than questions. Uh, because, uh, for example, the issue of uh, cost of IPv4 is not a problem for big companies. It's more the co uh, they prefer the cost of IPv4 to the cost of change to IPv6. 
Just to correct the remark, it's true that there is an issue with the iPhone, but it's not a problem. To come back the, to the observatory issue, the most important is not to get statistics, the most important is get individual statistics of the different actors and get podiums so that they see the relationship between each other. Well, one correction remark also, uh, IoT is not a killer application, I think so, because most of the constructor of IoT are not against NAT so because they don't want their devices to be frontal uh, to the internet because there are some issues about blocking uh, inner uh, inbound traffic for uh, for IoT object. So uh, so far it can work well with IPv4 and we need to be more critical concerning IPv6 because there are still security issues and especially quality of service issue because we don't have the same SLA on the equipment that are compliant uh, and, and the compatible IPv6, but they are hard-coded for IPv4 and not for IPv6. So the fact of saying that IPv6 is good, I, I do agree, but we need to be critical so that we can advance. Thank you. Um, I think we have a minute for, for each of, of the, the panel for can I come closing in? remarks. Um, uh, let me let me say that I think the the people talking about uh, IPv6 they just uh, you know looking for a killer application. You don't need to wait for a killer application. Let me tell you that the mobile is a killer application for the IPv6 to booming. And mobile, in general, is uh, you know you don't need to worry about too much of the security issue, particularly in the mobile device. And some of the uh, concern you're talking about the security issue. I do agree that it's an ISP, particularly you are serving for the, you know, the, the, the customer need uh, internet services. Um, my company basically, or, original is a national carrier, so we have all kind of application you can think about from mobile to fixed line to, you know, ISP. So we find that actually the really important the key application is turn on the mobile. When you turn on the mobile, that V6 is jumping. And you're talking about the ISP so service. I do agree, there is, a, there is a, some security issue you need to think about that. So at this moment, the, the, you know, the ISP service is only 25%. But mobile is a 75% now, so I mean, at least uh, turn on the mobile services. You know, there's a, there's a the real cure application. Don't wait for the IoT. IoT is not necessary in the uh, IPv6. Thank you. We need to, to close the, the panel. Maybe for sure we could have different views about a killer application. Uh, if we need or not a killer application to move to IPv6, the point is that IPv4 is exhausted and we need to move forward. And as regulators, I think we have to watch carefully to the market, to the needs, and make some actions to foster that IPv6 adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Edmundo. Uh, to sum up, I agree with Monsieur uh, Xavier, with uh, Samah, and with our colleague there that there is, yes, there is no magic and one solution uh, to uh, push for the IPv6 deployment. It depends from uh, one country to another. And the first step to be done, as I said, is to investigate the situation. And based on this investigation, we can put the steps and the agenda how to go with it. But one common there are some common points in this agenda, and one of them is the creation of the IPv6 task force. I believe the IPv6 task force in countries is very important, so the stakeholder can meet, can discuss everything under one roof, and they can, as a, we can say, they can put the national strategy for IPv6 for the country. It's a very important uh, step. Second, collaboration, working together, sharing information is very important. We can't do this alone. Third, training. We need skills. We need the know-how. And here comes the role of the technical community of, of 
RIR or for our self-drive NCC. We are doing our best in giving and sharing all the technical expertise with our members. Even we do some dedicated meeting with regulators and governments on high level to, uh, to give them the awareness of the importance of IPv6. And here I, I will leave 30 seconds just to Dr. Abdel Minam from Lebanon to share his views because we did a nice job with Lebanon for the last two years. Just give us uh, how you approach this from a government perspective. It's, it's really uh, a good experience that we, we did in Lebanon. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Merci beaucoup. Je parle en français ou en anglais. Pour English. moi, c'est beaucoup plus English facile. English for our colleague Mexican. Je, pardon. English for the, our colleagues from Mexico. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, first, thank you for uh, thank you very much to give me the floor. Uh, in fact, uh, in Lebanon, with uh, Ogiro Telecom, but uh, with the support of uh, RIPE, we have started in. Uh, 2015, maybe, to make uh, uh, preparation of all issues concerning the introduction of IPv6 and in our infrastructure with collaboration of all Lebanese ISPs, because in Lebanon we have a lot of ISPs, maybe something like uh, for private sector, maybe so something like uh, uh, 40 or 50 ISPs. Uh, and each ISP uh, has uh, his own uh, infrastructure. So, uh, with the support of uh, RIPE and Mr. Shafiq Shaya personally, and uh, our, our, uh, our colleague, our team in, in Ojiro Telecom, which is the uh, public incumbent uh, telecom operator in, in Lebanon, all of, all of the preparation issues, uh, technically, uh, uh, software speaking, uh, hardware speaking, uh, was uh, were ready, ready. Every sh everything is ready. Was, we're ready in June 2016, and uh, and uh, with the collaboration of ISPs and DSPs, data service providers, we have we have made this issue. Uh, now, so uh, a little conclusion, uh, and. Uh, everything wa was ready in June, July 2016, but from this day to, to today, uh, we are waiting uh, to, 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 uh, to launch, really, uh, the transition. Thank you. Thank you. And Pablo, please. I won't take much uh, time. I was just very impressed about uh, Guillermo's uh, quality of the presentation in terms of it, its technical um, aspects through it. Uh, I know that probably some in this forum might not uh, sort of fully grasp what was behind his presentation, but I think when we are talking about IPv6 deployment, that is exactly uh, what um, the um, uh, people involved need to get through and I don't think that is neither a policy or a regulatory question it is basically a technical uh, aspect to go through so that would be my uh, last contribution um, thank you Pablo and Guillermo thank you well just uh, not much to be added I um, uh, just agree with that the uh, IPv6 transition is not necessarily a technical issue. It's a commitment one. Training is really necessary and, uh, and a hard stuff to be taken first uh, care of. And uh, I couldn't agree more about this clear up that uh, Commissioner Juarez said because mobile is an application. So IoT, mobile, it's an application. That's the clear up of IPv4. Thank you. And Thank you. Um, I'm very sorry we are really over time. Thank you.